Friends, welcome to worship. It is so good for us to be together in the presence of God, whether it is literally here in Heritage Hall, while we continue to have the construction work done upstairs in the sanctuary, or online from your homes or wherever you happen to be. And whether it's this morning right now or you're watching at another time, we're worshiping together in the presence of God. We do want to give an update on our ever-changing COVID protocols. Um, as you can see, we are not um, asking people to wear masks anymore. Um, if they're vaccinated, we do encourage people to wear them if they're not. Um, and if you are more comfortable wearing a mask, please, please, please uh, feel free to wear one. And some of us were saying it's almost like driving without a seat belt now. It just feels strange. So whatever makes you comfortable. Um, we're also not requiring signups to come for worship in Heritage Hall. So please come. There's plenty of space and we love seeing people here. As we join our hearts in uh, worship today, we also join our prayers. And if you have a prayer request that you'd like to share and you're online, you can either post it in uh, the Facebook chat or um, best practice would be to send it to prayers at grandpres.org. And Joy will pick those up and get those to me. So if you have joys or concerns, um, please send them in and we will include them. Friends, God has gathered us in this place where we hear stories that show us what God's kingdom is like. God summons us here where we learn how to serve our God without reservation and without hesitation. And God will send us from this place to tell others of God's hopes and dreams so that they too can choose to follow God. Let us worship. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. God of light, you fill our spirits with energy and grace. You are the source of everything we need. We confess to you, though, a certain weariness that creeps. When the burdens become too great and the road too long and long, we get tired and burned out. More than ever, that's when we need you the most. But we turn away, frustrated that life isn't easier or angry that you're asking too much of us. Open our hearts to you again, loving God, and pour in your spirit. Help us to remember that you are the source of our strength. 
Fill us up and make us whole once more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news is this. In Christ, we are forgiven. Let us find peace. Peace with God, ourselves, and one another. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. This it's a little low over there. Our liturgical reading uh, this morning is from the book of Romans, and biblical scholars all agree that this was written by St. Paul. Uh, during his third missionary uh, trip, uh, he was in Corinth when he wrote it in the year 57 or 58 AD. Paul was uh, born both a Roman citizen and a Jewish a rabbinical uh, Pharisee, but he had a conversion experience on the road to Damascus, as you'll remember, converted to Christianity. I'm reading this morning from The Message, uh, written uh, by Eugene Peterson in contemporary langu language, and the, the verses are Romans chapter 12, one through three, and later, verses 9 through 13. So here's what I want to, you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing the goodness to God. No. God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not but by what we are and do for him. Love from the center of what you, you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. The word of the Lord. Be Come on up. Will y'all be comfortable sitting right there? Because I have some things to show you. Good morning, and if the children want to come closer to their screens, today's story that Karen's going to read in a little bit is a parable. And Jesus used to make up examples so that the people living then would better understand the lesson that he wanted them to learn. So let's see what this parable is telling us and what he wants us to know. So it's about a wedding. We all know what a wedding is like, right? 
Well, this one is about being ready for the wedding. Ready for how? Well, that's what we are going to learn about. So back then, their weddings were a little bit different. You see, they had bridesmaids like we do now, but they carried lamps down the street like in a parade. I know. Let me show what they look like. They looked something like this. It had a rag on the top, and they would hold it up so that they could see. And the only way that they could get this lit was they would pour oil onto the lamp, and then they would light them. And the rags would be on fire until they would run out, and then they would need more oil. So they needed plenty of oil. and. In addition, this story happened at midnight. You know how dark it is at midnight, so they really needed their lamps. And because without that, it would be really hard for them to find their way. So the Bible uses examples of, for people that lived then, right? And they would really understand what he was talking about, like, don't let your lamps run out of oil. But that's not how we do it today, right? So, trying to think of another example. If Jesus was here today talking to us, he might talk about, it's summer, he might talk about going on a trip. And maybe a trip to the beach or a swimming pool. And in order for you guys to have the very best time, and the most fun and get the most out of your trip, you would need to get ready ahead of time. You'd have to take time to think and plan and pack. So you might pack something like suntan lotion, right? If you're going to the beach, of course, you would need a swimsuit and maybe some goggles. Can you imagine going to the beach without a swimsuit or <laughs> without suntan lotion on our skin, how it would burn? And if you were going a far away, you would definitely need an airplane ticket. So without that ticket, when you tried to get on the plane, they might have to shut the door and say, I'm sorry, you don't have a ticket. So you wouldn't enjoy your trip at all. And thinking about you guys, you're about to move into a wonderful new home. And you're going to have to prepare for it, right? You're going to have to pack, and you're going to have to plan, and you're going to have to wrap things carefully and be ready for that. So what God wants for all of us is that we're ready. He wants us to have the very best life we can have and find our way even during those hard times. And that <clears throat> means accepting his love and his instructions and giving it back and sharing it. And we can't just do that on a whim. We can't get close to God without getting ready, just like getting ready to go on a trip. And some ways of doing that is like what y'all are doing today. You're hearing his stories. You're, you're learning about prayer. And you're being around people who can help teach us. And you're so lucky because your parents care and they want you to have that. It's just like having enough oil in your lamp or everything packed well in your suitcase or getting ready for a wonderful new adventure in your lives. So in Jesus' story back then, some of the bridesmaids weren't ready. You'll hear about that. I hope that you'll be ready for any trip that you have and any move that comes in your life. And I hope we'll all be ready to draw close to God's good life for us every day, good days and bad days. Would you pray with me? Dear God, all around us, thank you for these children. Thank you for your stories. Help us to really understand them and keep encouraging us to get ready to accept all your goodness so we can really get close to you in good times and not so good times. Amen.
I'm thinking about Joy and Jack Heyer, who are about to go on a trip as well, and maybe some of you are too. As we come to a time of prayer, we have a number of joys and concerns to share with each other today. A joy is we want to celebrate the birthday of Larry Worcester, who turned 96 earlier this month. So if you're watching, Larry, happy birthday. <laughs> We lift up um, the friends and family of Tim Sawyer. There's just such a sad loss this week. Uh, Tim died unexpectedly on Monday, and we hold his wife, Ruth uh, Sawyer, in prayer. Ruth is part of our bell choir and was probably going to be playing today. I don't know. Um, and Tim's sister, Michelle Bain, and their whole family. The service is going to be on Friday, June 18th at Lake Hudson at 9.30 in the morning. Um, Tim was an arborist and having it outdoors is just the perfect way to celebrate his life and give thanks to God for him. We pray for Christy Wilson, um, Brandon's wife. Brandon is our custodian here and IT guy. Christy was diagnosed with COVID about 10 days ago and is having a really rough time. And so prayers for her recovery and for Brandon as he takes care of her and their daughters. Uh, and prayers for everyone who's still dealing with this. We pray for Jeff Kurtz's father, Gordon Kurtz, um, who fell when he was on vacation in Florida last week and had to have emergency surgery for uh, torn quad quadricep muscles in both legs. And so prayers for him as he recovers and faces the long period of um, uh, recovering and doing rehab for that. And um, we pray for Dick and Laura Main and their ongoing recovery and are hugely grateful that they're with us here in worship today. So our prayers are with you as well. Also want to pray for um, those who are celebrating Pride Month and especially Pride Week. And we hold our LGBTQ family, friends, and acquaintances in our prayers as well as the wider community. Um, including their families. And we pray for a safe time of celebration with freedom from fear of attack or judgment or intimidation and a sense of being loved and belonging. For this and for everything we raise in prayers, let us join our hearts and our minds before God. Loving God, we come to you in complete and utter trust. You read us like an open book. You know our inmost hearts. So we come praying not because we have to tell you something you don't already know, but because opening our hearts to you connects us to you more deeply. You pour your love in, and we feel blessed. We come to you with prayers of joy and celebration, for special birthdays of people we love, for getting together again with family and friends, the people we miss so dearly, for ventures out into the world we took for granted, for healing and recovery, for moments when brave people step up and others feel heard and seen and accepted and loved, for allies who are there for us when we need them most, for beauty, so much beauty, and the delicious lingering of taste and smell and feel of the wonders all around us. It fills us up. God, we thank you. With all our hearts, we thank you. And we come to you with prayers of concern for people we know who are going through very difficult times. Some are wrestling with their identity and purpose. Some are feeling fear of others' condemnation. Some are battling illness, serious illness, illness that came out of nowhere, or a lingering malady that chains them to pain. 
Some are feeling grief, that deep kind of tear your heart open grief that sometimes feels almost impossible to bear. God, we pray for healing and comfort and peace. With all our hearts, we ask for your peace. And we come to you with prayers of hope, that we remember this isn't as good as it gets, prayers that we can stay open to what you have in store, that you have a vision for us and that your vision will become our vision. We pray that we'll stop trying to do everything ourselves and start leaning on you more and more that we might rest in your loving arms and fill up with your spirit and go out again into the world refreshed and restored and re-energized, full of your light and your love. God, hear these prayers and all the unspoken prayers trying to make their way out of our hearts. Hear them all for we make them in the name of our Lord Jesus. And we pray the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a time of offering, and we offer ourselves to God in so many ways. Among them, with our money, with our resources, and there are ways to give online or here in person. But there are other ways to give as well, and I'm inviting Mel Fraley to come forward and tell us another. And read her right-hand man. <laughs> Good morning. I couldn't find an easel, so I brought the next best thing. <laughs> And he's very versatile. Um, I only have a minute, so I'll make this quick. But we are going to have a bake sale. And it's going to be on June 26th. It's the same day of the great Granville garage sale. So what I need from you is to bake. Bake as much as you want. And you can bake cakes, <laughs> pies, <laughs> muffins, <laughs> bread, <laughs> and our famous Presbyterian cookies. <laughs> and so, you can uh, bake your items and deliver them to the church on Friday, the 25th, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. We will be here to gather your items. And then you can also go on uh, Genius, Sign Up Genius, and you can fill out a slot where you can work. You can either work to help pick up the items or you can help sell the items. All of the proceeds go to the Licking County Housing Coalition. So we really need you to bake. And if you can't bake and if you can't work, come and buy. You know, got a lot of good cooks in this church. So remember, it goes to the Licking County Coalition of Housing, and whatever you deliver or whatever, however you participate, you're going to help somebody in Licking County. So, we got to go because I got to keep baking. <laughs> See, he's good. <laughs>
Our gospel story this morning is actually the first of three parables that comes from the gospel of Matthew in Matthew 25. If the phrase Matthew 25 rings a faint bell, it's because we've been talking from time to time about being a Matthew 25 congregation. What's a Matthew 25 congregation, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. The Presbyterian Church USA, of which we're a part, designates a church as a Matthew 25 congregation if they've made the decision to actively engage in the world to serve people who are hungry, oppressed, imprisoned, or poor. That shorthand, Matthew 25, comes from the parable we'll be reading in a couple of weeks, the last of three consecutive parables in that chapter in Matthew's Gospel. So in that last parable, the one we'll be getting to in a couple weeks, in that last parable, the story goes, the Son of Man comes and praises those who fed him, gave him water, clothed him, and visited him. And and these people scratch their heads and say, when did we do any of these things? And he answers, any time you did this for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it also for me. In other words, serving other people is serving Christ. That's what it means to be a Matthew 25 congregation. So we made that commitment, what, a couple years ago, Ellen, was it? And our mission committee has been formulating a vision for how we can live out that calling in tangible and concrete ways. And honestly, that whole goal fits into who we are. I mean, when we did the Mind the Gap survey, there was a strong sense of wanting to do hands-on mission. So I know there's a lot of interest. And over the next few weeks, we're gonna be hearing about several different opportunities for doing just that, like what Mel was talking about this morning. But my sense of this is that even though we're talking about these very concrete, immediate ways we can help, the vision is going to be much bigger and much broader even than that. We need to start here in the small in particular, but we also need to be going forward into the bigger vision that I believe God has for us. So I want to spend some time this month in worship to open the door to explore what that might be, and especially how we get there. And what I mean is not just what we do as a church, but how each one of us as individual Christians learn how to serve and follow Christ in this way. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring the three parables found in Matthew 25. We'll end up with the last one, of course, the one with the question, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or imprisoned or sick? But first, I want to look at the two parables that come right before it, because they're pretty juicy too. And I believe that they all fit together with some profound truths and they they build on each other. And I think these are truths that we need to hear if we're really gonna be of service to anybody. So let's begin today by reading the first of those three parables in Matthew 25, the one that Ellen talked about in her children's sermon. This is what Jesus said. God's kingdom is like 10 young bridesmaids who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but no extra oil for them. 
the wise ones took jars of oil to feed their lamps. Now, the bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In the midnight hour, someone shouted, He's here! The bridegroom is here! Come out and meet him! Then all the bridesmaids got up and got their lamps ready. The foolish one said to the smart ones, Our lamps are going out. Lend us some of your oil. They answered, There might not be enough to go around. You'd better go to the dealers and buy your own. So they did. But while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. When everyone who was there to greet him had gone into the wedding feast, the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came, the foolish ones. They knocked on the door and said, Master, we're here. Let us in. Let us in. He answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know you. So, stay alert. You have no idea when he may arrive. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, my husband and I have been watching a lot of romantic comedies about weddings lately. I'm not sure how it got started, except that we watch something on Netflix and the algorithms pick up on these things and they start presenting more and more of the same kind of show. The storylines in these movies are all a little bit different, of course, but the themes are almost always the same. Can the couple overcome the odds and really tie the knot? Will some ne'er-do-well relative blow things up by their interference or bad behavior or by exposing some long-hidden secret? Will some other couple fall in love along the way? Will someone in the story grow up, mature, and be better able to love? That last one, it's almost always in there. Someone is changed when a wedding takes place, and it's not always the bride or the groom. Now, I'll grant you Matthew's story about a wedding is not exactly a (laughs) rom-com, but the themes aren't all that different. Something happens that threatens the wedding. In this case, the bridegroom is late. It doesn't say what the delay was about or what caused him to be away in the first place, although some scholars speculate that the groom is at the bride's father's house negotiating the terms of the dowry. And the bridesmaids are waiting. Actually, the word means virgins in the Greek. And these women are actually part of the groom's entourage. So maybe we should call them groomsmaids. In any case, they're waiting for him to come back. And they wait. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. Some are prepared for the wait, and others run into trouble. Now, you might ask, why would Matthew tell this story about a wedding? I mean, surely it's not really about a bride and groom. Well, he's making a point. He's actually worried about the church, the church folks he knows, the people in his community. They've been waiting for Jesus' return, and they're getting impatient. They can live in this in-between for a while, but it's stretching out a lot longer than they expected. Not just months, but years and decades. A whole generation has passed and Jesus has not come back. What are they supposed to do? 
How do you live expectantly when you don't know how long you have to wait? What if it's more like a perpetual engagement where the wedding may never take place? That's what it seems like to them. And it's wearing everybody out. Eventually, they all fall asleep. They just get tired. But you know what's funny in this story? That seems to be OK that they all fall asleep. There's no criticism for that part. Staying hypervigilant and on edge doesn't do anybody any good. That's not what we're called to do. What's not OK? What's not OK is having your lamps burn out. The only difference between the 10 maids is that five have extra oil and five do not. Which leads me to wonder, maybe being tired is OK, that it's natural, it's normal. But burning out is the problem. It's about burning out. Now, before we get too much farther in this story and what that burning out means and how we can avoid it, I want to talk a little bit about that whole notion about waiting for the bridegroom to return and what that means. That is to say, what does it mean for Christians to be waiting for Jesus to come back? Because I don't know about you, but I was not raised with that notion being a central part of my faith. That was never taught to me as a major theme in Sunday school or in worship. And even though in the communion liturgy, we often say the response, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, we hardly ever talk about the return of Jesus. I should say, I hardly ever talk about the return of Jesus in my sermons. But this is a central part of the story, right? It's the whole premise of the story. So what do we do with that? One of the most helpful and hopeful things I found in preparing for this sermon comes from a, a brief commentary by a scholar named Mark Douglas. He walks through a variety of theological interpretations. Some will want to say, for instance, that the end is coming soon. You can see the signs in all kinds of historic events. And we should be ready to jump on the train at any moment. It's apocalyptic. Others will say, no. Once Jesus rose from the dead, he handed over the keys to the kingdom to us. Everything's in our hands, and we'd better live as well as we can. There is nothing to wait for. But those are not the only two choices. He offers a third way, one that opened my heart. He says, the text reminds us that this is not as good as it gets. That the bridegroom's delay does not mean he will not come. And that the party will not really start until he arrives. It asks us to live in hope for what has been promised and what will be but is not yet. Anything that gives me hope right now, I grab onto. And this is not as good as it gets, sounds mighty fine to me. Here's the thing, whether you can personally believe that Jesus is coming again is not the point. This kind of hope does not depend on your belief system or your faith or even on your ability to lean into stories like this one. As Douglas writes, knowledge, faith, and love, 
Those are tools for living in the time before eternity, not tools to gain entrance into it. Do you see the difference? They're tools for living in this time, not the key that opens the door to heaven. What we need is oil for our lamps. What we need is to keep from getting burned out, whether it's by cynicism or exhaustion or bitterness or despair. As I was working through this passage, the the words from Romans 12 bubbled up. The more I read Matthew 25, the more I heard Romans 12, the part that Larry read just a little bit ago. Don't burn out, Paul says. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Be good friends who love deeply. Love from the center of who you are. I just love that. Don't burn out. So how do we do this? How do we stay prepared? What's the oil, for heaven's sakes? And where do you buy it? (laughs) It's the love of God burning in our hearts, right? It's the spirit of God breathing in us. It's living inside God's presence as much and as often as we possibly can. It's centering our lives there. In other words, as Paul says, keeping our lamps full isn't something we do for God. It's something that God is doing for us. If we bring our vessels to God for refueling, Paul warns us not to get it backwards. It is a recipe for burnout if we think we have to create light for God. If we think we can keep ourselves primed and pumped by ourselves. Paul says, living as every one of you does by pure grace, it's important that you do not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God is doing for us, not by what we are and what we're doing for God. Do you see the difference? This is incredibly important. We can't fill ourselves up, only God can. And we need to open the vessels of our hearts and our lives to the light and the love of God because only God can pour that into us. Otherwise, we will burn out. I guarantee it. There is no way around it. What Paul says is this. Take your everyday, ordinary life just yourself, as it is. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. That's how we keep our lamps filled. As we, as a congregation, move towards looking at service, being Matthew 25 people in a Matthew 25 congregation, this is where we need to start. The temptation will always be there to think that we can do this on our own. That's what our culture teaches us. 
that we are self-made, independent, autonomous creatures. We think in terms of what we have to give. And we do have a lot to give. We have so much to give. I mean, next week's lesson is the parable of the talents. And we'll take a deep dive into what that means. But I believe we have to understand this first, that we depend on God and God's energy and God's strength and God's light, and that our hope comes from that place. And that our ability to keep fueled and not burn out comes from the power of the Spirit. That's where we need to start. Let me close this with a word of prayer, and it's something that I blatantly stole. It's from a friend of mine, an acquaintance named Tom Schumann, who is a pastor in our presbytery, and I love what he writes. And so I offer this as a prayer to God from us and for us. Let us pray. You do not want us to be ignorant of your dreams and hopes for us, God of holiness. So you speak to us in parables. So we might pay careful attention to your words. You tell us stories about our grandparents and the faith so that we might become mentors to our grandchildren and theirs. Filling us with the holy oil of generosity and grace, you make us ready to welcome Jesus Christ into our lives and to open our hearts to those who are in need. On this day, we choose to serve you, God in community, holy in one. Amen. I would like to invite the Norris Hardesty family to come forward. And I'll ask you to stand um, in front of the communion table facing everybody, if you would. It is our, our custom here when a family leaves us um, to say a blessing and farewell. Uh, Brian Norris and Jessica Hardesty and their children, Joe, Virginia, and Tabitha. Um, Brian has been here serving as a professor at Denison for the last two years. Um, the family was still in Charleston, South Carolina until COVID hit and <laughs> Jessica could um, uh, work remotely. Is that correct? She is an environmental biologist, uh, and so uh, she was able to work as well. And now they're off to, on another adventure um, to Jefferson City, Missouri, where Brian will be taking another teaching job. And so we want to offer this, um, this prayer and this sending. In baptism, they were claimed by God, marked as Christ's own forever, and joined to his body by the Holy Spirit. In this community of faith, they have heard the good news of the gospel, been nourished at Christ's table, and sent out to be Christ's witness in the world. God has blessed them and made them a blessing in our life together. And we will miss them, but rejoice that we remain part of one body and continue to share in Christ's ministry. So faithful God, keep, preserve, and protect Jessica and Brian, Tabitha, Virginia, and Joe. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make them salt of the earth and light for the world. Lead them to new ministries, secure in the faith that binds us forever in the body of Christ. Amen.
As we go out into the world, let's keep ourselves open to this incredibly precious light that God offers us. Let God fill you up with that oil so that your lamp can stay burning. Be prepared, not because you have to go do something, but because you get to be called by God. And God wants to fill you and surround you and let your light shine. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and in you now and forever. Amen.